On Rosh Hashanah, we read from the Torah. Day one, we read chapter 21 of Genesis. And day two, we read chapter 22 of Genesis. So chapter 21 and 22 of Genesis are the readings of Rosh Hashanah. What I wanted to do, or what I set out to do, was to examine these readings and to find out how many of the themes and the concepts and the lessons of Rosh Hashanah are hinted to in the stories of Genesis 21 and 22, and maybe go through and see how many of those ideas we could find to maybe revisit the themes of, of Rosh Hashanah, see the stories, and try to find connections to the stories and the deep understanding of the stories and the Rosh Hashanah that is swiftly approaching. I want to make a few disclaimers before we begin. Number one, a lot of these ideas that we're going to cover today are huge concepts, central concepts in Jewish philosophy and Jewish theology, repentance, what are you living for, what really matters in life. A lot of them are, are really weighty, heavy, central ideas, and of course we can't do them justice in the time allotted, so that's disclaimer one. Think of it as a Wikipedia stub, some of these things we're just going to throw out ideas and move on to the next idea. And also, when I started researching for for this topic, I just said, okay, I'm going to read and see what we find. And I'm pretty sure that if I thought longer or harder, I would have found even more connections uh, between Rosh Hashanah and the themes of Rosh Hashanah and the readings that are associated with the day. Of course, it's needless to say that these readings were not arbitrarily selected. It was like, hey, you know what? We have all the people who are a captive audience in the synagogue, and they're praying for a long time. Why don't we read from the Torah as well? Of course, that's not the way it works. These readings were selected because they really are going to focus us, orient us to the themes of, of Rosh Hashanah. So that's what I wanted to do this year. Look at the readings and see what we find. So before we begin, let's go through a general just overview of what these readings are. What's the stories that we're covering? It begins with the conception and the birth of Isaac. The next event is Isaac's circumcision at eight days, even though the previous parsha, chapter 17 of, of Genesis, Abraham is already circumcised, but Abraham is 99 years old. Ishmael's already 13 years old. So they're circumcised much later in life. But Abraham's told all successive children, all, all future children, when they're eight days, that's when they get circumcised. And thus, Isaac is the first one to be circumcised at eight days. There's a really interesting weaning party that they did for Isaac when he was around two years old. And then there is the conflict that Isaac has with his half-brother, Ishmael. Ishmael is sent away. He almost dies is saved in a miraculous way. Abraham strikes a treaty with Avimelech. He plants the Aishel, this house of kindness on the crossroads where he reaches out to people, travelers. So that's the first day's reading. And the second day's reading is the story of the binding of Isaac, where God instructs Abraham to go take his son, his only son, his favorite son, bring him to some place where he's going to be... Uh, offered as a sacrifice, and they take a three-day trip, and eventually they go to the mountain, and it seems like Isaac is right on the brink of being offered as a sacrifice by Abraham, and at the last moment, God says, stop, okay, you proved yourself, I know that you're totally committed to me, gives him a blessing, Abraham renames the mountain, and he returns back home, and of course, the very next event is... Sarah finds out about it, and she right away dies. And now there's also a postscript to the story. Right after the episode of the Binding of Isaac, we read about Abraham's 12 nephews that are born. It's almost thrown in like an afterthought. It's like Abraham almost sacrifices his one son, or his one primary son. And oh, right after that, he found out that his brother, Nachor, had 12 sons. Mazel tov. Amazing. So it doesn't seem to really fit into the story, but that's also part of the reading of, of Rosh Hashanah, and we could assume that it's connected to the, to the ideas of Rosh Hashanah. Okay, so that's the overview. Let's go through these storylines one by one. 
So it begins with the birth of Isaac. But chapter 20, which is the story that immediately precedes the birth of Isaac, tells of Abraham traveling throughout the land of Israel. He travels to a place called Gerar. And in Gerar, his wife Sarah is abducted by Avimelech, the king of Gerar. She's very beautiful, even though she's already 90 years old. She's very beautiful, and he's very desirous of her. He takes her, and she tells him, oh, I'm not uh, Abraham's wife, I'm Abraham's sister. He tries to approach her, but God comes. God appears to him in his dream and tells him, don't get close. This is Abraham's wife. Abraham's a prophet. If you don't return Sarah to Abraham, you're going to die. And he's like, well, she, she told me, she, he told me she was my sister. She said, she's my sister. I'm totally innocent. And God says to him, BS, maybe. Just know that you better return her to Abraham or else, or else you're going to die. And not only that, you and everything that you have is going to be destroyed. And of course, he wakes up the next day and has this reckoning and he gives Sarah back to Abraham and asks Abraham to pray for him. And the chapter ends. Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Avimelech, his wife, and his maids, and they were relieved. For Hashem had completely restrained every orifice of the household of Avimelech because of Sarah, the wife of Abraham. So what this means is that Avimelech and his whole household was stricken with a terrible illness that all their orifices were clogged up, which doesn't sound very pleasant. And Abraham prayed, and all their orifices were open. So they were able to go to the bathroom, they were able to filter out all the things that need to exit the body via the orifices. That's the background to the story. The very next verse, Hashem remembered Sarah. Sarah's 90 years old, well past her fertility age, and God remembers her. And he did for Sarah as he's spoken. Sarah conceived and bore a son, on to Abraham in his old age, and Abraham renames his son as he was told by God when God promised him a year prior, you're going to have a son, name him Isaac. Indeed, this son is named Isaac. So Rashi begins the discussion by saying, wait a minute, we have this very unusual juxtaposition of Abraham praying that the orifices of Avimelech and his household open up, And indeed, that was successful. And then it seems like the same thing happens to Sarah. Her orifices, so to speak, that were clogged up, she wasn't able to have children, they also open up. That's not a coincidence. So says Rashi, that the reason why these two stories are juxtaposed is to teach you a very important lesson. When you beseech God for kindness for your friend, and you incidentally need the exact same thing, you need one thing. Your friend also needs that same thing. And you said, you know what? I'm not just going to pray for myself. I'm going to pray for my friend as well. Therefore, when you pray in such a fashion, you pray for yourself and you pray for your friend, then your prayer is empowered. It gets stronger. It's amplified. And you're going to be answered first. That's what Rashi tells us, quoting from the Talmud. And therefore... Abraham prays for Avimelech, he needs the same thing, and therefore his prayer is answered, and therefore these two stories are connected. So that's the first idea that we find, again, the very first verse, and looking at the very first Rashi. The prayer of someone who prays for someone else is empowered, is made stronger, and thus is more efficacious. And the first question is, you know, why is such a prayer more effective? Why is when someone prays for someone else, Why does it make their prayer more effective? So I think there's an idea here that is very central to Rosh Hashanah. The Nefesh Chaim writes, Nefesh Chaim is a a late 18th century book authored by the primary disciple of the Gon of Vilna, Rabbi Chaim Volozhiner, named after the city that he opened yeshiva in Volozhin. So this book is is a seminal book on, on Jewish philosophy. And he talks about prayer... He said there's different attitudes that someone can have with prayer. There's different attitudes. You can have a prayer and say, you know what? God has the purse strings. He is impressionable via my prayer. And therefore it makes sense for me to go pray and ask for what I want. 
I want help. God has the power to help me. And therefore, it's appropriate for me to go ask God for my needs and for my desires. That is a legitimate form of prayer. However, we find out that the highest level of prayer is almost altruistic prayer, where someone is not praying for their own individual needs. Rather, they're praying to try to perfect humanity and to perfect mankind and to reveal God in the world. When we say that Abraham began the process of tikkun olam, Abraham began the process of fixing the world, what does that mean? It means that Abraham began the efforts to publicize the name of God in the world. That's Abraham's role in history. And our mandate as the nation that Abraham spawned, our mandate is to continue his job to complete what he began, to reverse the sin of Adam, to restore God's dominion and hegemony and presence in the world. That's the highest level of prayer, where someone is praying not for their needs, so to speak, but for the needs of this mission of Abraham of revealing God in the world, almost like praying for God himself, praying for God's agenda. And he points out, he says, if you look at the prayer of Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, we say, Talmud tells us, that's when all the goodies for the whole year are being dispensed. And therefore, you would think if there's any a day, if there's any day of the year, any day of the calendar, where we should be praying for our needs, for our for our agenda, for what we want for the upcoming year, it would be Rosh Hashanah. That's what you would think. Yet you look at it, and there's nary a reference of any of our own desires. The only thing we pray for is for God's name to be revealed in the world. It's a, it's a day of prayer, of revelation of God in the world. That's why one of the major themes is about God's kingship, that God is king, but it's hidden. And we're trying to reveal that. We're trying to make God's kingdom not something which is hidden behind the facade. Rather, it's revealed to all. That's the highest level of, of prayer. He points out also that the prayer, we know the Talmud tells us, corresponds to sacrifices. Three daily sacrifices, really three daily sacrifice activities, two sacrifices plus one activity, and therefore three daily prayers. That's what the Talmud tells us. But he points out what kind of sacrifices are these daily sacrifices that correspond to the daily prayers. We know there's all kinds of different sacrifices. Some sacrifices, you just kill the animal and you eat the meat. It's like eating steak. Animal's dead, the meat's kosher, and now you could go eat to your heart's content. That's many sacrifices. Yet we see that the sacrifices that are the ones that prayer is based upon are ones that are totally for God. And therefore the prayer, the on its highest level, is prayer to try to effectuate the agenda of God to reveal God in the world. And therefore, what my grandfather suggested, that when I pray for other people, in effect, I'm praying for a more perfect world. And he added another deep point. This was a mind-blowing point to me. He said, the Talmud tells us, that when someone is suffering, it's almost as if God is suffering. And again, this is a theologically problematic idea, because we don't believe that God could suffer. But it's, so to speak, that's what the words of the Talmud, so to speak, when when, when, when someone is suffering, it's so to speak, God is suffering. And therefore, when you're praying, when Abraham is praying to heal other people, in effect, he's praying to relieve the pain of God, so to speak, and therefore to heal the people. And thus, when Abraham is praying for Avimelech and for Sarah and for himself, really what we're being told over here is that he's really praying for God. He's really praying to achieve that a more perfect world, a more fixed world, a uh, a world where tikkun olam is more manifest, a world where God is more manifest, and therefore his prayer is empowered, it's more effective, and thus he is answered first. I'm like, this is the very first verse that we're reading here on Rosh Hashanah, and that's literally the theme of Rosh Hashanah. The theme of Rosh Hashanah is that all our prayers are about revealing God in the world. It's prayers not for us. It is for God. There is actually one prayer that we say in Rosh Hashanah that's personal. 
we're making a personal request. And that's the prayer of Zachreinu Lechaim. Remember us for life. A teen who is desirous of life. Inscribe us in the book of life. A life that is for God. Even the prayer that when we're asking, we're beseeching God for life, to be inscribed in the book of life, we, we clarify. What kind of life are we looking for? A life that is dedicated for God. As we see again, a high level, but one of the central themes of, of Rosh Hashanah is manifested right in the very first verse of the readings, and that is there is this higher level of prayer that really is the agenda, the objective of Abraham, the agenda, the objective of his nation that he spawned, and of course, the theme of Rosh Hashanah that we're, we're, we're having this touch point with the ultimate responsibility and mandate of our nation to reveal God's name in the world. That's for starters. So what happens? Abraham prays, and God listens, God remembers. Sarah conceives, Sarah gives birth. At the age of 90, she has a child. The child is named Isaac. The Talmud tells us something very fascinating. What day of the year did Sarah conceive on? And the answer, unsurprisingly, is Rosh Hashanah. And Isaac was born several months later on Pesach. That's what we're told in the Talmud. The Talmud book of Rosh Hashanah, page 11a. On Rosh Hashanah, Sarah was remembered, was redeemed, i.e. she conceived. Moreover, Rachel, the next very, or one of the next very famous barren women who had a child after many years of, of agony and pain, that too... Joseph was also conceived on Rosh Hashanah. Moreover, Hannah, Hannah, the mother of, of Samuel, read Samuel chapter 1. She's suffering terribly. She's praying from the depths of her heart to have a child. And she, of course, becomes the mother of Samuel, the greatest of the, of the prophets of, of that era. Someone that even is, is on par on the same pedestal as Moses and Aaron to a certain extent. When does she conceive? She also conceives on, on Rosh Hashanah. So there's this obvious connection here between what's happening to Sarah and the power that's inherent in Rosh Hashanah. Sarah changes. Our sages tell us, based upon verses, uh, in a few verses you read, that Sarah is so excited and she says, who is the one who said to Abraham, Sarah would nurse children? And the obvious question is, well, Sarah's not nursing children. She's nursing only one child. What does it mean Sarah is nursing children? Rashi right away jumps on this. Again, we have to know that Rashi is the eagle-eyed observer of the verse. Wait a minute. Sarah has one child. Why is she nursing children? So says Rashi, quoting from the Talmud, a lot of people got very cynical. They said, well, Sarah was married to Abraham for 60 years with no children. And suddenly she spends a night with Avimelech. We know that nothing happened. But the cynics don't know that, ah, this is not Abraham's child, this is Avimelech's child. So Rashi tells us a few things happened. You know, that first of all, Isaac was a spitting image of, of Abraham, but also that the people also claimed that it wasn't even Sarah's kid. She, she brought in some, they found some kid in the street, they found, they picked up some kid from the homeless shelter, from the uh, orphanage, and that, that's the child. So what happened? All the neighborhood moms brought their babies to Sarah, and she nursed them all. That's what Rashi says. She nursed them all. That's part of the miracle. It wasn't just that, you know, she was nine years old. She's not, she's not breastfeeding. Oh, no, this is bottles, right? No, she was able to nurse the whole neighborhood. And we find out that the natural wrinkles that she had, they also went away. Her skin restored itself to uh, the skin of, of a young a young woman. Uh, without the aid of Botox. Moreover, Sarah also quips. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Whoever hears will laugh for me. So everyone's laughing. Again, the name Yitzchak, the word for Yitzchak is laughter. Tzchok is laughter. And therefore, he's named after this laughter. It's such an amazing, it's so happy. People are so exuberant that they're just laughing out loud. That's That's what the verse says. But it, Sarah says specifically, not just, I'm going to laugh, but everyone's laughing with me. What does Rashi say? Quoting from the Midrash, 
Sarah wasn't the only barren woman that was able to conceive and, and bear children. Many other barren women as well became fertile with her. Many other ill people, sick people, were healed with her. Many other prayers were answered with her. And there was abundant laughter and joy and exuberance in the world. Everyone's laughing. It's just a, a total revolution that's that's happening. And the way it's explained on the Kabbalistic level, it's with the idea of Ha'arat Panim, which means the 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 bright visage of of God and the the idea is is that God could choose to infuse the world to bequeath to the world a lot of goodness and that's called as as if God's facing us or God could turn away from us and then we're almost on our own and then the world is 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 goes through periods of scarcity bad luck and just bad things happen to us What's happening over here on this Rosh Hashanah is that the entire world's changing. God is revealing his face to the world, and therefore all good things are happening, and people are just, they're drunk with joy. Everyone's laughing because it's just working out for everyone. There's a revolution, there is a change. And what our sages tell us is that this is not just a coincidence. Oh, it all happens to happen to Rosh Hashanah. Sarah, it happened to Rosh Hashanah. Oh, and Rachel, and, and, and Rachel as well, and, and Hannah as well, and other good things happen to happen. Not just good things, transformative things, things that were not possible previous. Sarah was barren, and suddenly everything changes. Physiologically, she changed. What I say just tells us is that that's because of Rosh Hashanah. What is Rosh Hashanah? Again, it's the day of creation of man. Every year, we filter through that same day and that same power of that day. And thus, if this is the day of the creation of man, you visit that same juncture in spiritual history. That's the day where man could be created anew. The day before Shana, Sarah was barren. She was infertile. She could not bear children. If you take her to the doctor, the doctor says, I'm sorry, she does not have the ability to have children. Sorry. And you know what? That doctor would be telling the truth because the day before Rosh Hashanah, she was not capable. But what happens? Comes Rosh Hashanah, it's a new day, it's a new year, it's a new world. God is recreating mankind, and he recreates Sarah, and now she does have the ability to conceive. And you know what? She does conceive. But this also filtered out the whole to the whole world. Everyone has now been given a new lease on life, and there's joy and exuberance everywhere, and the whole world is is laughing. We believe in an infinite God, but a finite world. That's the Jewish belief. Infinite God, finite world. But because God is infinite, and he has to make some point where the finiteness ends, he has to make the parameters, the borders of the world, that therefore means that the world can change. The world is is dynamic. Because God could choose to give more of his infiniteness to extend more of that to the world or, or to curb that. That's the idea that we just mentioned, the idea of Harat Panim. God could turn his face, so to speak, to, to the world and to endow the world with more goodness or the God to curb the goodness. It means the world's in flux. The, the ratio of goodness is always changing. When is the day in the year which the rules that govern Mankind, the rules that govern the world, the amount of latitude, the amount of finiteness that God decides to extend to the world, that changes. When does it change? On Rosh Hashanah. Every Rosh Hashanah God says, okay, how much goodness is the world going to get this year? How much of my infiniteness am I going to endow to the world for this upcoming year? The previous Rosh Hashanah, Sarah was, okay, last year you were, you were infertile. And you know what? This year you're going to be infertile again. That didn't change from the previous year. But Rosh Hashanah is the day where it's, it gets evaluated. That's the idea of judgment. Every person, everything, it's decided what's going to be their, their future. How much is God going to give them? A life that we have, a breath that we take. I say, just tell us, every time you breathe, you have to thank God. Because every time you're breathing, God says, breathe. Now, of course, we could get into the, into the minutia of that, and we could be very pedantic about it. But the big picture is that Every time we breathe, it's because God says, I'm extending from my infinite infinity, so to speak, the fact that you're going to breathe. And Sarah, on that Rosh Hashanah, Sarah was said, okay, now you are fertile. It's a new world. 
all the parameters of the world get readjusted each Rosh Hashanah, and therefore this is the day where everything changed, but this is the day that we too have the power to change as well. Isaac is born. At the age of eight days, he is circumcised. I found this so striking that the day that we talk about the first eight-day-old circumcision, we talk about Rosh Hashanah. It's the day we read is Rosh Hashanah. And I don't want to get uh, too technical here or too graphic here, but the idea of circumcision on a spiritual level is based upon the idea that every part of the body corresponds to a certain spiritual idea. For example, the right hand versus the left hand. We're told that the right hand of God is kindness, the left hand is judgment. And therefore, the right hand is stronger than the left hand, and therefore there's more kindness that God dispenses to the world versus judgment. If it was the other way around, it would be a much harsher world. It's an idea that is ubiquitous in, in, in the Kabbalistic literature, and you find hints, hints to it also, Rashi, throughout the Torah. The mitzvah of circumcision corresponds to the idea of the revelation of God's crown in the world. And, you know, it's no coincidence that Abraham is the one who kickstarts the mission of reversing what Adam did. Adam lived in a world, at least initially, where God was ever-present. He did the sin, and thus he made God hidden, so to speak, and now the mission of mankind is to undo that. In the words of the Talmud, Adam was created circumcised, but he pulled his foreskin to once again make himself uncircumcised. That's the words of the Talmud. You read that simply, you think that Abraham, that Adam did a very painful procedure, but that's not the point. On a deep level, the metaphor is that Adam arrived in a world where God was ever present, but he undid that, and now Abraham is the one who's given the mitzvah to, to, to symbolize in our very body, in the part of our anatomy that we're most similar to God. That's where we have creation, the idea of create a human to create like God in the image of God, specifically where we're most similar to God. We do this mitzvah, which symbolizes the revelation of the crown of God in the world. And there's no day where that theme is, is more present than on Rosh Hashanah. Again, all the praise of Rosh Hashanah, the history of Rosh Hashanah, that's when God became king. God became king on Rosh Hashanah because that's when Adam was created and therefore there's now a subject and God is recreated or recoronated as a king every year and it's just not a coincidence that we read about the circumcision, the very first circumcision done properly at eight days, the circumcision which symbolizes, which parallels the theme, the central theme of Rosh Hashanah that we read that on, on, on Rosh Hashanah every year. Now, there's an interesting juxtaposition here between the idea of laughter. It's really striking. Again, you, can't, you, cannot, you cannot miss this when reading this story. So Isaac is named laughter. And Sarah is saying, oh, everyone's laughing. It's so amazing. It's so funny. It's just, who would have thought? Uh, Sarah's 90. She has a baby. And everyone's having babies. And everyone's happy. And everyone's being healed. And it's just so much laughter. And then right away, we read, child grows up. He's two years old. And he... There's a party to celebrate his weaning. And the very next verse, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian. He was laughing. Sarah saw Ishmael now laughing. Metzachik, same word. So what does that mean? What did she see? So Rashi gives us three explanations to explain what she saw in Ishmael's laughter. The first explanation is that she, that she saw him doing idolatry. The next explanation is she saw him doing a sexual crime, sexual morality. And the third explanation is she saw him murder. And I find this so striking that we have this laughter in verse 6, which Rashi tells us, it's just it's so happy, I'm so thankful. What an amazing change. Everyone's healed and everyone's happy and everyone's joyous. And verse 9, three verses later, Rashi says, oh, well, Ishmael's laughing. That's a very different kind of laughter. That's the three most egregious, worst sins in the world. And that's what 
Ishmael was doing. Later on, we find out that Ishmael had not actually committed any sins because Ishmael is going to be banished and he's going to be saved because at that moment he is still innocent. Yet Sarah, she sees him laughing and she's already able to see there's something corrupt inherent in the laughter. She sees that this is a laughter of, of mockery. Uh, this is a, this is a sardonic laughter. This is a laughter that has within it the roots of all these future sins. So I just find this so interesting that you have the same word three verses apart with wildly divergent interpretations. And of course, there is a consequence for Ishmael's behavior because he's going to be banished or Sarah is going to propose to banish Hagar and her son. Abraham's going to demur, but God's going to say, listen to Sarah, she's a greater prophetess, and indeed Ishmael is banished. But isn't it interesting that the very same word, three verses apart, has completely opposite meanings? I wanted to maybe suggest that this is also maybe a lesson for Rosh Hashanah. The Torah is giving us its take on Sarah's laughter, on the rest of the people's laughter, whenever when everyone has all these these good fortunes befall them. And they're telling us what what the Torah, the correct take is about Ishmael's laughter, that his laughter already hints at a very sinful uh, future. I, I think if we were present and we happened to witness Sarah laughing and then we witnessed Ishmael laughing, I don't think we could be able to tell the difference. To us, it would both look the same, equally innocuous, Yet the Torah reveals to us that one of them was a huge mitzvah of appreciating God's goodness, and the other one was a harbinger of the worst sins yet to come. I think we can suggest there's a broader point. And that point is that there's that the way we judge circumstances, situations, and people and events is very different than the way God judges. If we saw these two events, we'd say they're the same. Sarah's laughing. No, she's laughing. No, oh, it must be so funny. She has uproarious laughter. Ishmael's laughing. Oh, I wonder what he's laughing about. That's how we would judge a situation. And yet we see that the Torah, and again, even though Abraham initially doesn't seem to agree, but God confirms that Sarah's correct, the Torah sees one as a tremendous mitzvah. Is there a greater mitzvah than appreciating what God's doing for you and, and being joyous with that? It's a great mitzvah. And one as being the total opposite a laughter that's rooted in the worst sins. Maybe we can suggest that that same idea is maybe one of the reasons why our predecessors were so fearful of the day of judgment. We can never be sure that we have a, the correct take. Our judgment is is accurate. We all hopefully think about ourselves as, as generally good. Yet when you read the story, it does open up the following question. Are we sure that God agrees with that? How does God really view me? Is it possible that all the mitzvahs that I did, maybe there was some, something about that that could question the legitimacy of those mitzvahs? Maybe I was doing it just for honor. If you do a mitzvah because you want honor, is that really a mitzvah? Is that, was that a full-blooded mitzvah? And I think there's, there's other examples of, of this phenomenon where people, their self-assessment is very distant from God's assessment. So, for example, Korach. Korach launches this whole rebellion. He thinks he's the most righteous person in the world. He thinks he's greater than Moses. Yet we find out that he's doing a terrible sin of sowing discord amongst the people, and he and he and he's killed for it. And many of the onlookers of the episode of Pinchas, they think he's nothing more than a homicidal psychopath. That's what they think about him. Yet we find out that right away he's lauded by God. He's given all kinds of promises. He's upgraded to be a Kohen. And I think these examples show that we can't be too comfortable with our own status and our own judgment and our own take on the situation. And therefore, there's a reason for us to be to be nervous about the judgment of, of Rosh Hashanah. My grandfather, of blessed memory, in one of his books, he ends his book with a terrifying statement. This is the last book that he published in his lifetime. And... He actually was planning on publishing it posthumously. It was going to be his like legacy gift to us, but they convinced him to publish. He was 90 years old when he published it. And the very last portion deals with the various levels of achievement that someone could get in Olam Abba, in the afterlife, based upon the behavior that they have over here. That's what it deals with. 
And he quotes a contemporary of his, someone who's a little bit older, one of the great revered sages of his era. His name was Rabbi Elia Lapian. He was widely considered to be one of the great sages and pious, righteous men of, of, of his time. In fact, there seems to be documentation that he had a visitation of Elijah. How do I know that? Because that's what my grandfather writes. Yet, he quotes the teaching in the Talmud. The Talmud says as follows. The Talmud says, Jewish sinners with their body and non-Jewish sinners with their body. What happens to them? They descend to Gehenna and they are judged in Gehenna for 12 months. And after 12 months, their body is destroyed and their soul is nothing but a heap of ashes. And a wind comes and the wind blows the leftover residue of their soul under the feet of the righteous. That's what the Talmud says. Uh, that's scary, right? That's kind of scary. So Rabbi Elio Lepian said that this, even though it sounds very negative, actually, this is a very high level of achievement. When someone's only burned to get him for 12 months and there's still something left of them and the wind comes and blows it under the feet of the righteous, it's such a high level that he hopes that after he dies, he's able to obtain that level. That's what my grandfather writes about someone who allegedly had a visitation of Elijah. The, the, the tzaddik is like, he's so unsure with himself. Who knows? Do I really have I accomplished anything? The self critique is so intense. And the absorption of how Torah judges someone and how that could be wildly different than how we view ourselves, that was so ingrained that he said, I hope I even achieve this level. And to us, it sounds like this is the sinners, the people sit with their body. Oh, it's a terrible thing that they're burned for 12 months and whatever's left is swept under the, under the feet. It sounds like it's terrible. And he's like, ah, I really strive to hit that level. That's, a, that's an illustration of how the righteous view themselves. And I think from this story, and the contrast of the laughter of Sarah and the laughter of Ishmael, there is some credence to the idea of we really should not be too comfortable with our own stature because who knows really what God really thinks of us? Who knows what it looks like when we get scrutinized by God and the laughter that seems innocuous to humans, God puts the lens on it and, well, what does it mean? There's three things it could mean. It could mean either murder or rape or idolatry. That's how the Torah views it. And for us, if we were the judges, we would say, this is totally innocuous. Let it pass. It does not pass. And instead, Ishmael is actually banished as a result of, of this episode. Sarah hears what Ishmael is, how he's behaving. And she says, okay, we have to drive him out. Abraham is greatly distressed. He doesn't want to send away his son, apparently. And God tells Abraham, don't be distressed. Whatever Sarah tells you to do, you listen to her. Isaac is going to be your true heir. Yes, the son of, of, of Hagar, Ishmael, is going to be made to a great nation. True. He is your offspring, and therefore he's going to be a great nation, but he's not going to be your heir. He's not going to be, be the one to complete what you began. So Abraham wakes up in the morning early. He gives provisions to Hagar, and he sends them off. And she, she goes on her way. She's in the desert and the water runs out. And Rashi tells us the water runs out because Ishmael was sick and therefore he's drinking a lot of water and therefore they run out of the water and now Ishmael's about to die. So let's look at this event of, of the banishing of Ishmael. You know, we know that Abraham, he is heralded as the paradigmatic figure of kindness. He's the one who really personifies the idea of, of kind of doing kindness to other people. Yet we see in the readings of Rosh Hashanah that he does two very unkind things. Namely, he banishes his own son and he tries to murder his other own son. What's the deal? How, how do we reconcile Abraham's kindness with acts that seem to us to be decidedly cruel 
I think the easy answer is, is that Abraham was not someone who was doing kindness in isolation. Abraham was someone who was completely a servant of God. And if God tells you to do something, you do it. Even if it's against your tendency, your tendency is to do kindness. But your tendency to do kindness is because that's the will of God. Abraham wasn't someone who happened to do faith and happened to do kindness and those two are not related. He was doing the will of God. The will of God is that we become kind. But when the will of God is that we act in a cruel way or in a way that appears to be cruel, he did that with the same eagerness as he did all his actions because all his actions were trying to fulfill the will of God. In fact, we find that in both of these stories, Vayashkem Avraham Baboker, Abraham woke up in the morning early, both to banish his son and to go execute his other son, Isaac, the binding of Isaac's story. Both of them he does eagerly. He wakes up early in the morning. He he runs to do it because he's motivated by one thing and one thing alone, and that is doing the will of God. And I think we pray in Rosh Hashanah, remember us for life, give us life, inscribe us in the book of life, but then we, we, we clarify what kind of life are we asking for? We're asking for we're asking for life that is living for God. I think this is a great illustration of someone who actually lived a life for God. These stories, it seems to be stories that are conflicting with Abraham's character. Abraham is the, is the, is the paragon of kindness and he's acting in a cruel way. But we find out, no, Abraham is not a man of kindness per se. Abraham is a man of doing the will of God. Abraham is the man who is living a life solely focused on the agenda of God. Normally, that means do kindness. When God says, go banish your son, it doesn't make sense to us. It's unkind in our eyes. But what motivates Abraham is living a life based upon what God wants. God wants me to banish Ishmael. He banishes Ishmael. God wants me to execute Isaac. He does all he can to try to execute Isaac. Now, it's interesting. We find in the verse... Uh, verse 11, this matter greatly distressed Abraham. He was very distressed. So why was he distressed? So we would say because you, know, you have your son. He's a teenager. How bad is he really to send my own son away, to send Ishmael away? That's something that's very hard for a parent to do. That's what we would say. You look at Rashi, and Rashi says that, no, Abraham is distressed for a different reason. Abraham is distressed because his son is part of his son Ishmael is going on a bad path. And then Rashi says, as a second explanation, he's also distressed about sending away his son. Now we know, a general principle, whenever Rashi gives two explanations, he gives the first one, which is the one that most fits the the true understanding of the of the narrative of the verse. And then if he adds the second one, the second was one one is a little bit more midrashic, it's a little bit more homiletic. It's a little bit more, it's a little less connected to the true understanding of the verse. So it's an amazing thing we find out here about Abraham. Abraham's distressed. He's going to have to send away Ishmael. There's two reasons why he's distressed. He's distressed because any parent would be distressed sending away their kid. But he's also distressed because Ishmael, his son, is heading in the wrong path, in the wrong direction. Which one of those emotions, which one of those feelings is more correct, tells us Rashi, the, the fact that his son is going to a bad path, that is what is truly distressing him. And yes, as an afterthought, it's also not pleasant for a parent to send away his his child. I think that's, again, another example of the fact that Abraham is living a life for God, his motivation, his agenda is the agenda of his soul, and that's what we're re- really asking for God. Abraham is coronating God in his own behavior because he is submitting his own personal interests to the will of God, he's saying, God says, I'm listening. What does that mean? That shows that he's submitting himself. He's subservient to God. God is his king. He is living the life of someone who's living a life for God. I think we could say broadly, to make this more relevant to us, the spiritual sensitivity that Abraham displayed was not a nice add-on. You know, it's really nice to also cultivate your spiritual side. I think that's a good thing, but it belies the fact that we view ourselves as as bodies. We view the body's agenda as 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 who we really are. That's our identity. But don't forget about the soul. Throw it a bone. Abraham was not like that. Abraham lived the life of the soul. Abraham lived the will of God. That everything else 
The fact that he was worried about his son, the fact that he had the, the, the filial care and concern for the well-being of his son, that's the add-on to the agenda of, of the soul. So Hagar and Ishmael are sent away. Ishmael gets sick. They finish the water. And he looks like he's about to die. Hagar sits a distance away. How far away? A few bow shots away, the Torah tells us. Because she doesn't want to be privy to the death of Ishmael. Ishmael's about to die, and therefore she doesn't want to see it. She doesn't want to witness it. Now, Rashi tells us that when Hagar left, she left Abraham, and she returned to the idolatrous ways of her Egyptian forebearers. That's what Rashi says. I want to just say this quickly without getting bogged down. This is another example of, of the harshness of the Torah scrutiny because we know that Hagar is going to come back and after Sarah dies, Hagar is going to remarry Abraham. Obviously, she didn't go back to the ways of idolatry. She didn't truly go back, but she thought maybe, you know what, maybe I'm done with this whole Abraham thing. I'm done with this whole monotheism thing. And she she kind of edged a little bit towards, let me just go back to where it was comfortable. Let me just go back to my origins. And consequently, it's already in the Torah's eyes. It's already viewed as she strayed and went back to idolatry. That's another interesting point. But the Torah tells us that Hagar, when she deposits Ishmael, she's a bow shot away. What that reveals to us is that it wasn't just Sarah who knew that Ishmael was rotten had a wild temper, and had a tendency towards violence. It was a volatile child. It seems like Hagar is also aware of that. You know, Why would the Torah tell us that she's bow shots away from him? What it, I think it's telling us, a simple understanding is that she knows he's violent and she doesn't want to be the receptacle or the recipient of his violence. And therefore, she's like, I'm going to be out of range. I don't want to put, pick up his bow and start shooting me. I'm going to go out of range just in case Ishmael wakes up and is angry at me. Even his mother knows that he has a, a violent tendency. So what happens? She's sitting at a distance. She starts crying. And verse 17, God heard the cry of the youth. And an angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, Why are you upset? Don't worry, God heard, God heeded the cry of the youth. And it adds a few words. In his present state. Ba'asher husham, in his present state. What does it mean in his present state? So look at Rashi, it's an amazing Rashi, and it's just so relevant to Rosh Hashanah. It's like this one you don't even have to think about. Because the Talmud actually says it. It says Rashi, what does it mean? It means that Ishmael is being judged as per his current behavior, not in relation to how he's going to behave in the future. Why? Rashi tells us. The angels, at this time, said to God, we have Ishmael on the ropes. Why? We know that his descendants are going to cause all kinds of pain to the Jewish people. Let's just finish him now. Solve the problem. Nip it in the bud, right? Imagine how uh, world history would be different. The fish mill doesn't get the water. And what does God tell them? God says to him, okay, what is Ishmael now? Don't tell me about the future. What is Ishmael right now? Is he righteous or is he wicked? And they said to him, well, he hasn't yet sinned. Sarah was able to see in his laughter the the future, the, the, the what it portended. Sarah could see that, sure. But his current behavior right now is one of, of righteousness. And therefore, says God, I'm judging him as per his current behavior. That's what it says. God is here to the cry of the youth in his present state, the way he is right now. Yes, Ishmael's a rotten boy. He has violent tendencies. He was justly banned from his father's home. And even his mother, she positions herself an hour shot away because who knows what he could do. He's a little bit of a, uh, he's a little bit of a loose cannon. Yet, God says, you know what? All these things are true. Nonetheless, his current behavior is one of righteous. And therefore, he's judged in relationship to his current behavior. Says the Talmud, a person is judged on Rosh Hashanah 
in relation to their current behavior. And it quotes this verse. The verse says, God hears, God heeds the cry of the youth in his present state. Even in the future, he's going to sin, doesn't matter. Right now, you're righteous, and therefore you're judged as, with respect to how you are right now. And therefore, what do we see here? We see a, a, a tendency or, or a, a advice, good advice, that on Rosh Hashanah, I'll make sure that at least on Rosh Hashanah, we adopt the, the path, the behavior of righteousness. That at least on this one day, we shouldn't act in angry fashion. We shouldn't do too many sins, try to speak pleasantly, be kind, be as righteous as we can, because when God is judging us, God's not judging us not in the past, not in the future, right now. How are we right now? It's a very important point. I'm just trying to make sure that where a behavior is sterling, and that way that's how we should be judged for the upcoming year. It's a very deep lesson that I heard from my, from my Rebbe. There's another place in Jewish literature where we find the exact opposite. Ishmael is, we're told, and we judge him the way he is right now. Yet there is an entire law based upon someone being judged not the way they are right now, but the way they are in the future. And that is the Ben Sore Umore, the wayward and rebellious son. That's the son who they're, they're a little indulgent, they like the wine, they like the meat, they steal a little bit, some petty crime to fulfill their habits. Says the Torah, we got to execute them. A kid steals some money from his parents and buys some wine and eats it with bad company and has some meat. That's a reason to kill them? Says the Talmud, yes. Why? Because the Torah is able to extrapolate from their current behavior how they're going to be when they grow up. And if there is this combination, this cocktail, no pun intended, of events, where someone is stealing at a very specific age, and they're eating the meat, they're developing a habit for fine meat and fine wine, and they're hanging out with bad company, we know for sure they're going to be a life of a criminal, they're going to eventually murder people, and therefore we kill them now when they're innocent. So how do you reconcile that? On one end, Ishmael's like, yes, in the future he's going to be a murderer. Yes, yes, sure, sure, sure. But right now he's righteous. Can't kill him. Whereas the Ben Somar, it's the exact opposite. We say, because in the future he's going to be a terrible person, he's going to be a murderer, we kill him right now. Literally the exact opposite. And all the commentaries ask this question, and all of them offer various answers. So, for example, one of the answers is, well, there's a difference between human courts and godly courts. Human courts judge in relationship to the future. Godly courts are the opposite. They only judge in relationship to the way the person is right now. And therefore, when God's judging him, it's the way, like Ishmael, it's right now. And whereas the human court, it's based upon the future. That's one answer. But... My Rebbe, shall live me well, he, he said a fantastic answer with a, a powerful, powerful lesson for us, for Rosh Hashanah. A person is judged in relationship to their current behavior, but not just their current behavior in isolation, their current behavior stretched out, extrapolated, played out over the future events of their life. Ishmael, yes, He was in the future going to be a sinner. But right now, he's righteous. And if we stretch out his behavior, if he continues on this path of righteousness, he'll forever remain righteous. And yes, he's judged religion to the way he is right now, but not just the way he is right now in isolation, the way he is right now and what that shows us vis-a-vis looking just at his relationship, his behavior right now, looking to the future, it's righteousness as far as the eye could see. Whereas the Ben Saramora, he's already behaving in a way that if we extrapolate the future, if we play it out, we know that he's going to become a murderer and a sinner, and therefore we kill him right now. It means there's no kind of inconsistency. Both of them are judged the way they are right now, but with the way they are right now, spread out of the course of their lifetime, and Ishmael was righteous now, and spread over the course of his lifetime, where there's no indication in his current behavior that he's going to be the murderer, and therefore we have to judge him righteously. Whereas the Ben Sora yes, he hasn't committed the murder yet, but if we extrapolate his current behavior over the course of his lifetime, we see that he will commit a murder. Therefore, even now he's already guilty. Let's take this idea and flip it on its head. When we are judged on Rosh Hashanah, we're judged based upon our current behavior. But also, the Almighty is able to kind of extend that current behavior into the future 
and to see what would happen if if someone continues along that path to infinity. And therefore, Ishmael, he's just righteousness, and therefore, yes, some something else is going to change, is going to disrupt his his trajectory, but we don't see that yet today, and consequently, he's judged righteously. But what happens if someone says, you know what? I'm going to embark on a path of righteousness. I'm going to take the first step of a thousand-mile journey towards total righteousness. How is that person judged today? They're judged per their actions today, but also extrapolated over the course of their lifetime. And if you start in Rosh Hashanah and you say, you know what? Today's the first day of me envisioning my new self, then you're judged based upon your current actions, but again, spread out over the course of your lifetime, you'll be judged righteously. And thus, again, a very valuable tip to how to make sure that we uh, that we ensure that we are judged uh, favorably in Rosh Hashanah and our current behavior on Rosh Hashanah is one of righteousness. We have this benefit of saying God's not going to judge our current behavior in isolation, in a vacuum, rather extrapolated over the course of of a lifetime, and thus if we take that first step, the Almighty already sees, if you continue along that journey, what it's going to look like, and that's that's a very good thing, and that's uh, again, a good, a good tip to to uh, result in a wonderful judgment. I know we're out of time here, but there's one more thing that I wanted to share just from this story. I guess we only covered the first day of, uh, of Rosh Hashanah reading. But it's interesting, we see that Hagar and Ishmael, they, they leave, they survive, they get the water, and they end up in Egypt. And what happens? He lived in the desert of Paran. His mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So we're told not, not a great deal about his wife. We only know that she, his wife came from Egypt. That's the only thing we know really uh, about his wife from the verse. So look at Rashi, a beautiful Rashi. We know that Hagar, she herself was from Egypt. And therefore, she is going back to Egypt. That's the place where she's more comfortable. That's where she grew up. But therefore, when she's selecting a wife for her son, she goes back to her homeland. And Rashi tells us that there's a popular adage that people say that uh, relates to this point. If you throw a stick up in the air... It will fall down right where it began. People go back to their roots. That's the idea. And, and Hagar, she's looking for a wife for, for Ishmael. She goes back to her roots. Like you throw the stick up in the air, and she's been far, far away from her roots, but ultimately she comes back to her roots. That's what Rashi says. I was thinking, isn't that what Rosh Hashanah is all about? Rosh Hashanah, you know, with the whole, our whole life, we're up in the air. We're living this whole life and we have all kinds of distractions. We're floating aimlessly, forgetting, so to speak, what we're living for. And then Rosh Hashanah is the day where we, we go back to our roots. We remember, you know, where did we come from? We go back to, to Adam. Why was Adam created? What did Adam do? What are we living for? What is the national mission of the Jewish people? What are we here to accomplish? What really matters in our life? And we try to readjust our, our life trajectory every Rosh Hashanah to make sure that we're still on course to live the life that we really want to live. It's just a beautiful illustration. Like, you know, the whole year we're up in the air, we're like that stick, you throw it up in the air. And then Rosh Hashanah, we, we, we come back to our roots. We, we remember what we're truly living for, what we aspire to achieve in our life, and hopefully have that, that moment, that time in the year to, to again re-examine our life and, and try to again hone in on the message to hone in on what it is that we're here for and what it is that we're trying to accomplish. So those are some of the lessons that I pulled out from the Rosh Hashanah reading. There are many, many more. Of course, we haven't even talked about the Akeda and the, the Binding of Isaac and the Shofar, of course, the Horn of the Ram that gets caught, caught in the thicket and everything that that, uh, that, that portends. But uh, my hope and my blessing to all is that we have a Tzim Chazim where all of us are inscribed in the Book of Life, in the Book of the Righteous, we're stamped in the Book of the Righteous, and we all have a happy, healthy, sweet new year of wonderful Torah study and uh, wonderful camaraderie uh, together. It was a pleasure to be with y'all uh, this past year. I'm looking for another great year upcoming. 
My email address is rabbiwalbajim.com. I look forward to hearing any questions, any comments, any feedback of any kind. I deeply appreciate it.